Welcome to Night Light. Step away from the mainstream and gather around as we enlighten the world and our realities and travel this cosmic journey we call life. Join us as we share with you and provide that beacon that can guide us all to a better way. Explore with us as we examine a metaphysical montage of spiritual insights covering everything from the mundane to the magical, UFOs to unicorns, and everything in between. This is a time of awakening, of sharing and evolving, of spreading our wings and soaring on the cosmic breath of creation. Come and join with other light-minded spirits as we weave our lights together to seek understanding, enlightenment, and with a little luck, some wisdom. This is Night Light, a reminder that you are never alone. So glad you could join me tonight. This is one of my favorite authors. So um, you, it's it's just such a pleasure to have uh, Dean and Miriam with me tonight. That uh, I can't tell you how much fun I've had reading all of her books and um, stumbling over tons of names that that uh, shall remain nameless. Actually, um, the book we're going to be talking about tonight is Rukmini. And that's, I, I will I will warn you ahead of time, I am going to mispronounce everything, and hopefully she doesn't laugh so hard she has to leave. Um, the, name, the title of the book is Rukmini and the Turning of Time, the Dawn of an Era. And it's a book that is told through the voice of a dancer in ancient Dwarka, a city on the western coast of India. It was on a pilgrimage to Dwarka a few years ago that Dina experienced this lifetime, but even though this book recounts events in this dancer's life and follows her through three incarnations, the story is really not truly about her, but about Rukmini, the one who was working behind the scenes. And as Rukmini and Sri Krishna set the framework for the era that was beginning to unfold, this narrative shows how Rukmini Mata enabled those around her to fulfill some skaras, from past life, past births, and uh, the the karma, and that's the karma that's when accumulated in the cycle of life, death, and rebirth. Why didn't she just say, re, you know, reincarnation? Anyhow, bringing closure to unfinished relationships and desires. Dina included many stories told by women to other women, recounted by those living in Dwarka in close association with Rukmini, in the hope of showing how an incarnation of the Universal Mother comes to guide an evolving humanity. Dina began work in the interfaith movement in the 1900s as vice chair of the Millennium World Peace Summit of Religious Leaders held at the UN in 2000. She's the founder of the Global Peace Initiative of Women, and for over 40 years she has been a student of Yogananda and a meditation practitioner. She received an MA from Columbia University, and in 2014 she, re she received the Naiwano Peace Prize for her interfaith peace efforts. She's the author of the book, My Journey Through Time, A Spiritual Memoir of Life, Death and Rebirth, The Untold Story of Sita, and when the bright moon rises and this is the fourth book in that series and i totally recommend all of them they are all a joy and a pleasure to read i would really suggest you read them in order of publication because they get deeper and deeper and deeper as they go but you know your choice each each book truly would stand by itself reading them in order of publication um, gives you a, a greater flow of understanding of her process and the process she's going through in each book to explain certain aspects of life and reincarnation. So I welcome you to the show again, Miriam. Thank God your name is easy to pronounce. Thank you, Barbara. 
and you've got Rick Meaty's name fine that you you pronounced it perfectly. So um, I'll be tired. Uh, the names the names are not as hard if you get over that initial uh, initial feeling of oh how do I say this? They're actually not that hard <laughs> to say. It's phonetic and perceptive. As they as they appear, that's how you have to pronounce them. Well, I it was challenging, but you know, I it's it's like as we said before, you know, if you're reading a book, you recognize the name. You don't have to say it out loud. So, right. you know, happily, right. happily, I had that going for me here. Um, <laughs> one question now: each of your books has to do with the element of reincarnation starting with yeah. the first one that that had to do with your reincarnations and i adored that book i just i just loved it every time you had a next lifetime i just didn't want you to die again because i was having <laughs> <Any> <laughs> it, it it was tough but but then with the last 3 with the last three, yeah with the last 3 books you're in india and you're telling another story, but you're telling it through reincarnation. Uh, my question is, are you a part of this, or are you relating something that you have gotten? Um, I, I know you're channeling it, but is this? are you in this, or are you telling it as a viewer? So this is, this is a, a question that's difficult to, to answer, because um, when I wrote the first book, these were clear memories that I had of my past birth. And I actually went to some of the places to check myself out, whether what I was seeing corresponded to reality. Um, I did that uh, initially the first few births because it was quite an overwhelming experience because it wasn't just like, oh, yeah, I lived in Russia, I lived here. I actually relived those lives. I went through all the emotions. Uh, it was a bit destabilizing, actually. Uh, and I had nobody um, who I could talk to that first book. I mean, I did have one friend that I confided a little bit, but it was I had to handle it uh, on my own. Uh-huh. And, and you know, I was a single mom raising two teenage boys. It was a challenge uh, and, and depleting, actually, because of all the emotions that were running through me. And so uh, I, I thought that that, all I would see, I think I went that six or seven lives uh, sequentially, the last birth, the one before that, the one before that, the one before that. And it was quite an exhaustive process. And then there was sort of um, silence for a while. I didn't see any more. Then I took a trip to India, and I had this experience there where I found myself, uh, I went to the to the a place called Ayodhya, where uh, Ram and Sita had that had been their kingdom when, after they got married, and I started uh-huh. finding myself back in that time period, which is several thousand years BCE, and I and I and the whole story came to me. I was living that life as a servant. I was told to the voice of a servant, I was that servant, and uh-huh. I said to myself, well, "This is crazy. Am I was I that servant, or am I channeling that servant?" And I can't answer that. All I can say is that I experienced that life. That everything that she experienced, I was I was there with her. So whether I'm channeling her or whether <laughs> that is another <laughs> birth of mine, I don't know. Uh and then that it continues after that. And then I went on um and had the experience of a life in uh back in Vedic India and then one in China. My interest is 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 really looking at the whole uh process of cause and effect. So to know that we are born again and again and again is one thing, but what propels that? What brings us back? What What is this law that operates, that creates the conditions that we're born into? Nothing is accidental. Uh, all the conditions that we have in our life, we are created based on our past, uh, our past desires, our past relationships, things that are unfinished. So we've created the conditions in which we find ourselves. And so that's really been my interest uh, in understanding that, because if you can understand how the past has created your present, then you can more consciously work in the present to create your future, the future that you want. So 
then I did take a trip to Dwarka, which is an ancient kingdom, the ancient kingdom of Krishna. Now, Krishna is well known even in the West. He's a beloved, beloved figure, a, a comparable to Christ, really. Uh, and there are many uh-huh. similarities between the life of Christ. And although Krishna was a, a king, uh, um, there are many similarities uh, uh, to their lives. Uh, but the interesting thing, uh, and the same thing happened with Christ, where the, the women in his life were kind of given a secondary, a secondary role. Uh, uh, his mother, Mary, she's not a goddess. She's just a mother, an ordinary human being. Mary Magdalene uh-huh. sort of wiped out. The same thing happened in Krishna. Look, Mini was his wife, and hardly anything is said about her. Uh, instead, the whole Krishna story is around his um, his his childhood with Radha. Now Radha is considered to be the perfect devotee. She adores him. She worships him. So again, the role of the woman is to be worshipful, to serve. Well, that's not really the way it is. That's some patriarchal world view of the role of of, of women. And Rukmini, actually, the wife of Krishna, was his full partner, just like Sita. I tried to show that in the untold story of Sita, where, again, uh-huh. it, it, these are the two towering figures in India, Ram and, and Krishna. Krishna is said to be a reincarnation of Ram. Uh, Sita is his complete uh, uh, peer. Every bit is critical to, to the work that was taking place at that time. And the same thing is true of Rukmini. Rukmini. So in a way, uh-huh. it's telling Rukmini's story uh, through the eyes of this woman who experienced it, a dancer. A dancer in Dwarka at a time when society was going through a lot of changes. Uh, uh, um, and it's interesting, if you see the time of Ram and Sita, which is about, I don't know, three, 4,000 BCE, uh, uh-huh. Humanity was still very much integrated with the natural world. There wasn't a separation. There was no no wars, no slavery, no oppression, no conquest. I mean, it was a much more peaceful way of living in harmony with the natural world. By the time, 2,000 years later, when you're coming to Krishna's time, which may have been this controversy about when it was, but, but let's say it was about 1,000 BC, BCE. Already, the the, the 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 relationship with the natural world has changed. There are castes. There's there's slavery. There's wars. There's uh, all, all the ills that we see in society today were beginning to really penetrate society at that time. So so they were dealing with a whole different uh, set of circumstances, and the work that they did really addressed those issues at that time. And it, 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 it appears, it appears sort of that you are, you're almost going in in the beginning of a yuga or a shift in, in a yuga or a time frame or a two thousand yeah. year um, cycle. So so that so that it, it does appear that that you're hitting a time frame when um, these they, they were deities. Um, we're, we're at their height, and and, and I yeah. loved in in the last book how you um, uh, you you did you did go into how both Rukmini and uh, Krishna he was the masculine intellect science and she was the soft feminine spiritual compassionate. And the two of them together created the deity. Yeah, you know, they they were they were two complements. Yeah, yeah, they they were two parts of the same energy. Yes. Two, and two um, yeah, no, I I that was beautiful. Um, it it was it was fascinating, and I I loved the stories. I loved the I the the. Uh, Allegories, the parables that were told, um, and and with the, the war where where Krishna said, you know, he was between two 
two warring um, aspects. And he said, you know, one of you can have me on your side and the other one can have the army. And that was amazing. I mean, the wisdom of of Krishna and, and of course, you know, going back another 2,000 years to Sita and, and Ram, um, there, there was tremendous wisdom here. There was, uh, I, I like the fact very much so that, that you brought out the feminine in, in all of them, and especially in this last one where Rukmuni had the, um, well, she was one of his wives, and, you know, they never said she was his favorite, and yet you got the feeling that she was the head wife or, or whatever. But but she wasn't just his wife. She took on a whole, um, she had her own purpose in life. She had the, the center for women that were abused and destroyed and men who were going through difficulties and trauma too. So that she was a healer um, unbelievably so that, so that their their gifts of healing and their gifts of um, power uh, were very very unique, especially in this last book, um, which I found fascinating. And I can't remember which book it was, but at one point, um, it may have been Ram, who said he had to leave to go to the stars to visit other places. Um, mm, yeah, and so, yeah. sort of letting you know that, that their their realm of influence was not just the earth plane, but it was in other other places too. So it, yeah, it is yeah. very there there you know, there there really is the, the connection to um to Christ and the fact that, you know, it isn't just here but it's everywhere, which I felt was, was really amazing. What what do you think that that the the feminine side of all of these stories really haven't been told with the same degree of intensity that the male part has been. Well, I think I think that um, you know it, it, you were right when you talked about the the yugas when Ram and Sita were on Earth. There supposedly four different yugas, uh, and they uh-huh. and they go- govern the spiritual. Uh, perception. So it, it, it's nothing to do with whether you're living in a cave or living in a, 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 a big city. It has to do with whether you're living in a fully materially engrossed world or whether you're aware of the other realms. And so now we look at our advanced society, it's a completely materialistic society. We're completely oh, yeah. unaware of, of other realms. So in the higher ages, they, they didn't need to develop cities because they were in contact with all these other different realms, and uh, they 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 um, had a much ex- there was much less emphasis on the external and more on the internal. When Ram and Sita came along, that was beginning to change. It was not the Satya Yuga where there's complete harmony and deep spiritual perception. It was the Treta Yuga, uh, which which there's a a, a, um, a beginning of a decline in in, in spiritual perception. And a growing awareness of, of individuation. So it was a time when individuation, uh, separateness, me, ego, desires, you know, wanting to accumulate, to amass, that was beginning to happen. And what Sita tried to do was embed this love for nature in the human psyche so that we wouldn't totally disconnect ourselves. Love for the plants, uh-huh. for the forest, for the animal, and be able to communicate with them. By the time you get to Krishna, a few thousand years later, you're beginning to enter the Kali Yuga, which is complete materialism. And so what, what Rukmini tried to do is to cultivate the love for the arts. It was a time when the arts were just beginning to flourish. In the earlier days, I mean, the arts were a way of connecting to the higher realms. When you can uh-huh. have a direct connection, you, you didn't really need that. But dance and music and theater and writing, all that was beginning to, to develop at that time as a way to keep the memory of the higher realms alive. And I think that um, as we now, you know, they say we're, we've emerged from the Kali Yuga, we're entering the next Yuga, and so spirituality is now beginning to 
beginning to spread, meditation, uh-huh. acknowledgement of uh, rebirth, acknowledgement of the laws of karma, acknowledgement maybe of other dimensions. Uh, so we're beginning to climb back up. And I think that um, things will begin to shift rapidly. So for me, from an historical perspective, I think it's important to see, as the decline was happening, how these these great ones sacrificed to take bodies and a human life in order to keep the memory alive of what our purpose is here, who we really are, and and to spread and to spread love on the planet because that's the foundation of it all. Love is what keeps it all going. Yeah, and I think you know I I know with with the last book it was like. Um, the dancer, you know, they kept saying, you know, why don't you call on her? And and you know, it was like she she just for some reason she didn't. I I, I got the feeling that she was afraid to call on um, <clears throat> Romani for, for 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 fear that she wouldn't get an answer. And 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 the the reality is, all she had to do was call or ask, and she was there. And I think that that speaks to. Today, most of us, you know, um, the element of faith is is not as strong as once it was. And so that people don't want to ask for help on a spiritual level for fear there's nobody there to answer. I think also we, we, we get signs, everybody gets so many signs that we just don't see. We either uh-huh. uh, overlook them or we just are blind to them. Um, but they're continually signs. And part of the challenge is, is to open your eyes and ears and to see. I mean, I've become much more sensitive to that since I've been writing these books. To see the signs oh, sure. that you get. You, you know, I mean, we're not alone. <laughs> it's clear. No. <clears throat> but, but it's you know, it's the... The element of the um, of synchronicities of quote unquote coincidences. I mean, what what fascinated me was usually today when people talk about reincarnation, it's kind of like jumping lifetime to lifetime to lifetime to lifetime to lifetime, and and that's not quite how it happens. And in some of these lifetimes, people waited a thousand years before they came back to be able to synchronize with someone else who is being reborn into that time frame as well. So that it's, so that it's, yeah. yeah. It's incredibly and, complex. It's incredibly complex. It, it, yeah, go ahead. Well and, and and you know what sometimes people think I have karmic debt but I don't know what it is. It doesn't matter if you know what it is or not. You you just know if you're working through something that there has to be something going on here and, and that something that needs to be fulfilled or completed or resolved. And in in the book, I mean, I, 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 I forget, who was it, Anjuna, Anjuna or I can't remember. How do you pronounce his name? Um, Arjuna? He was a, Arjuna, yes. Oh, I said it right. Um, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Whoa. Um, he waited, you know, a thousand years to to come back at one point to To be able to resolve something that had been done, so that so that our lifetimes seem simple and not really that complex, and yet they really are because we are we are weaving ourselves through time, and sometimes it's thousands of years, maybe even more, where an issue is going to be resolved this lifetime, and you never know what it is or how it is, but. Sometimes you can feel that something has clicked, and it's like, ooh, something's finished, something's completed. You know, I can check something off on my list when I get to the other side. Um, but it, it just, it, it, it was. This last book was was fascinating, and I loved the way that that she explained the dance and how she became um, another person when she danced, and and how. It helped her to resolve things when she danced um, that she couldn't do on a consciousness level. And I think sometimes in a creative flow, that's that's what a lot of us do. We work things out in a creative way that 
bring something to completion that we, we don't necessarily know what it is, but but we we put something to bed that needed to be put to bed. Absolutely, I I say, I say that I work out I, I work out a lot of my karma through my writing, um, because I get to I get to see tendencies that I've had, and I can uh-huh. understand them. They may be latent in me now, or they may not be so prominent, but I can see where they've come from, and how I need to finish them, you know, overcome them. And so I think that you know. Through spiritual practice, meditation in particular, through uh, reflection, through looking at your life, you uh-huh. can tell a lot. You know, you might not have the specifics, but you can know where there are knots that have to be worked out. Uh, and and you know, whenever there's an emotional response, something is being triggered, and that's what you have to look at. I I, oh, yeah. I, I heard a I heard a, a, a Buddhist monk recently say. If you want to see how well you're doing in your practice, see how you respond to a challenging situation. If you're blaming something external, you know you've got more work to do. Whenever you're <laughs> blaming the external, <laughs> you know, uh, um, you, you know, it, it, instead of looking in, looking inward. I mean, the, the, it's always it's always the guidance is always to look inward, look inward, see your participation in it. Absolutely. And, and you know, this, what I find fascinating is um, Philip Lindsay's written a book called Isis Unveiled, and he talks about the yugas and how at the, at the, at the end of an age, usually uh, wise people come into an incarnation to help people make that step over into the next yuga, the next level of awareness, the next understanding. And you know, it's my feeling that we're at one of those stages. Um, absolutely, absolutely. We're, we're we're in a transition, and um, yeah, and and I think that's why you know the last 19th century, both in 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 India, Sri and Tibet as well, there was just an influx of um, highly advanced beings. The early 20th century as well, uh, uh-huh. and and just the you know, an, an unusually large group that came in. Uh, and I think it was, you know, to usher in this new age that is slowly unfolding. And what we're seeing, when we look at the chaos today, you think we're moving backwards, but we're not. What we're seeing is that the structures that were created in a less conscious time are no longer sufficient. And so they're failing. Right. They're cracks all over the place. They're no longer working. So we're seeing the breakdown of a system that doesn't work anymore. But at the same time, there's a lot of new thinking and and an emergence taking place that doesn't get much attention. Uh, but, But you can certainly see it in many ways. You see the spread of meditation practices. You see, I mean, I even heard one of the... um, one of our politicians during this whole mess of the last few days referred to karma. <laughs> and I thought to myself, it was the least, you know, place he wouldn't have expected. He said, oh, it's karma. And I thought, well, yeah, you know, that concept has really penetrated the mainstream now. People it don't has. necessarily it understand has. it. They have a very simplistic idea of it. But at least the concept that, that you know, that, that, that things, there's a cause that has an effect. Every Everything that happens, there's a reason for it. Nothing is arbitrary. Yeah, you know? I, I and, know and that. I, I really feel that, that we are at one of those time frames. And I think I wrote something for the website that, that said, you know, there are those wise people here, those <clears throat> people that have an ascendance of consciousness, but they're not wearing name tags because the last time they were recognized, we worshipped them and killed a lot of them. So they're they're really under the table, so to speak, at this particular moment in time, and, and yet their so. words, <laughs> yeah, 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 unless they're except their words, their words are out there, their philosophies are out there, and you can you can every now and then, I mean, Yogananda has wonderful stuff that he has written and and spoken yeah. of. Um, so I mean, there there are those that that are 
in the forefront to a certain degree, but I think there are a lot more that are that are out there just very subtly, very quietly putting thoughts out there so people can kind of kind of wonder what if and and I think that's where we are about now it's sort of like maybe what if there is something different what if there is a change that can help to 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 blend us all together and you know as a family i mean we don't want to have another war like the the mahabharata i mean you know that was that was devastating it was it was it was actually the first large scale war because it was you know all of the kingdoms from from afghanistan all the way down uh, uh, to the south of India um, participated in that war. So it was the first really large-scale war. And y- y- we have to move beyond the era of war. I mean, it's just, it's just, it's too dangerous. I mean, <laughs> we just got to move work. beyond the era of war. It's just, the, the old mentality of, of uh, you know, domination, if I, you know, if I don't like what you're doing or I want something you have, I'm just going to go take it. I mean, that's just an old mentality that has to die uh-huh. and so i think we're, we're it's becoming more glaring now the things that have to die so that something else can, can it can come in that will enable us to survive and and you know the earth to survive one would hope well i mean it, it it's when you when you look at what's happening i mean we are actually being sent back to work with the earth because there's no food in the stores. So, you know, we we are being sent back to um becoming one with the ground and one with the earth mother. And but but you know, it's I see so much su- such great possibility out there. And you know, you kind of want to just yell and shout and point a finger and say, you know, there that's that's where we should be going. Um, I, I I love the the compassion that the women were taught, and and the the love that they shared unconditionally. Um, that's the key. That's the key. The unconditional love. You know, I mean, why Rukmini, her whole life was devoted, and, and this is the most touching thing for me, to the specific issues of each person. You know, quietly, the dancer had a limp. She had 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 a tragedy in her life, left her with a limp. Why did Rukmini uh-huh. take such care to heal her limp? You know, of all the troubles in the world going on, uh, that's that's the love between the the um, that the that the the, the devatas, the gods, the, the enlightened ones have for us. You know, and it's a matter of being open to receive it and then returning it. You know the love right. that we're and given to give it out to the world. I think that's that's probably the most important message in there, and and it's it's the the unconditionality of it. It's the it doesn't matter. You know, you, you give it, you give it, you let it flood people, and you know it, it will it will affect them in an appropriate manner for them. Maybe not how you intended, but. But, but you know, it, it, unconditional means you let go of it, and you know it is it's 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 an amazing thing. And all throughout your books, all of them, the, the element of of compassion, of loyalty, of of um, unconditional love and sharing, um, is amazing. And you know the message is there, and and it's a matter of people picking up on it and. and Taking a look at their own lives and saying, you know, you know, am I am I doing this? Am I a reflection of this, or am I one of those hard hard headed jerks on the sidelines trying to get as much power and whatever as I can? And um, it's it's a wonderful guide to to paying attention and and seeing how how love and sharing it appropriately can can make life so much richer for everybody. And you know when you look at, and when you look at the situations that some of those those people in your books were in, they were not. Um, they didn't have it easy. I mean, no. especially at the, at the <laughs> no. 
I mean, no, 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 no. I still, I still am amazed, and I can't remember which book it is, but the the girl that couldn't get the celibate man to to love her cursed him for a thousand years, and all I could think of is what was she thinking? Yeah, it was the the bright moon rises. Yeah, she couldn't yeah. have the guy. So she, she she cursed him not, <laughs> not to see him for ten thousand years. <laughs> yeah, it was it was like holy mackerel. You, you know, you have no concept of time, clearly. Um, oh, but but then it worked. Totally it worked out. Of it. Yeah, I mean, but, you you have to look. I mean, it's actually changed my whole view of even what's taking place in the world today. Because I think to myself, you know, all this is going to change. It, you know, mm-hmm. it, it's not going to change in a year or two. It might be ten, twenty, fifty years, whatever it is. Yeah. The, the troubles that we see today are going to change into something else. Uh, and I think it will be better. I have a very positive view of the future because we're, we're, in an up, we're moving into an upward cycle and, yeah. uh, uh, and there's much more attention being paid to the spiritual realm of things, which will guide, I think, our development in the future. So, but you can't, you can't think in terms just of earth years, you know, like, you know, business, they go by the next, they go by the next uh, cycle, the stock market, everything goes by the next cycle. Politicians, they go by their two-year election cycle. You can't think like that. No. You, know, you have to take a longer view of, of of what's going on. I think yeah. that's, that's, that's one of the main things that comes out of all the books, that, that you cover a huge spectrum of time on, on the earth plane. And and yet, you know, in 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 the time of the immortals, it's nothing. But but it's nothing. It, yeah yeah. It, it, it's so it's, it's, you know they say a year here is like a day in the in the in the higher realms. So when we talked about ten ten thousand years, it was just a short period of time in the from the celestial view. So it's a matter of where you're looking at it from, you know. Um, I mean, there's no real, there's no real value to time. I mean, we we create it so that we can, you know, develop a, a certain type of life here. Uh, but as you begin to identify, I mean, one of the things that's happened to me through the writing of the book is my whole sense of identity has changed. Who am I? Yeah, one of those characters. Is this the real me? <laughs> you know. <laughs> well, well, I, I think don't you don't you have aspects of all of them? I mean, isn't you know That's you it. are I, you I, are maybe made up of of pieces and stuff. I mean, it's it's a little here, a little there. I, um, I'm made up of all of them. <clears throat> I mean, I'm no longer those identities, and when I leave this body, you know, I won't be Dina anymore. But uh, but but. But some aspects of Dina, I mean, some of the things, they're, they're certainly the, the things that, I, that have been important to me, I'll carry with me. Uh-huh. Uh, but but I, I don't identify as much with that personality or body as I did before I was writing the book. Oh, mm. geez. Well, and, and anybody who reads the book is going to wonder about their own life, their own journey, and... and what kind of of situations have they been through that bring bring challenges to this lifetime? I think that's that's the part that um, I mean. I once told an ex boyfriend that he was my karmic debt. Now that was probably not a good thing to say, but yeah, but it just. Yeah. <laughs> I, he, yeah. yeah, he asked a question about how, you know my feelings, and I said, "Oh, you've got to be my karmic debt." This just you know, but but it your books have have put a different spin on my philosophy of, of reincarnation because it isn't to, it, to me. It was you know there are there are things I bring from other incarnations that I I have traces of in this lifetime that I can use as tools. For, to deal with other things, but it's so much more. It's it's the reincarnation is for the evolution of your spirit, and therefore, it's the spiritual stuff that that has that carries the greater weight 
as far as karma goes, as far as treatment of other people and 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 sharing your sharing yourself unconditionally and stuff like that. It's 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 more than than you know. You were nasty to me two lifetimes ago, and now I can be nasty to you. Um, that's not the yeah, way it works. You're absolutely right. You're absolutely right. The thing that penetrates deeply, uh, it, it, the, the, and that's, that 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 doesn't lead is is love. When there's uh-huh. been a profound love, uh, um, and and where you've experienced this unconditional love, that is what that is a transforming. Uh, uh, um, Experience that 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 um, has a deep impact. You know, there there are minor things. You know, you mean to me, I mean to you. Those are those are just the most superficial aspects of it. <laughs> so the whole process is the awakening process, waking waking up to who we truly are. <clears throat> that we're divine beings. You know, that we come uh-huh. to Earth. This is not our home. We're here to awaken. <laughs> Uh, and little by little, we get we get prodded awake. We have moments of it. We, you know, when you ha- when you haven't uh, experienced that profound love, then aha, there's an aha moment, an awakening moment. And then we go back to sleep again, and we get busy uh-huh. with whatever it is. And then we have another moment like that. And so each life, I mean, it says, you know, one of uh, the great teachings of with Krishna is the Bhagavad Gita, where he gives so many. So many spiritual lessons, but he says, no step is lost on the spiritual path. Every step you take is a step forward. So, so that's, that's the evolutionary process. The whole reincarnation is an evolutionary process. You know, I mean, yes, there are people like a Hitler type who, you know, may go backward. <laughs> um, <laughs> or, or, you know, wasn't an awakening life for him, um, but... <clears throat> And, you know, no. there are rascals around like that. I mean, but, but it's, you know, his next life will be to help him awaken from his delusion. And it's all about waking up. So if, you know, yeah. if you've done terrible things, you'll have some circumstances that will help you wake up from that. Well, mm-hmm. I think the other thing, too, is is you you can't judge where somebody is on a spiritual pathway. Because there's no way of um, ascertaining that, and and yeah, I have uh, I've been in this field for a very long time, and I've heard people say things like, "I have to leave my husband because he's not as spiritually evolved as I am," and <laughs> y- you know, if you want yeah. an excuse to leave, just say you're leaving. Don't don't pull that because he could be more evolved than you after all he's put up with you for this long. So, you know, I mean, it, it, Absolutely. it's, uh, so, so it's, it's, it's a dance. And if people understand that it's a dance and they can do it together and, and really, um, achieve, um, a great awareness by, by sharing it with another person. After all, you know, Krishna had, um, Rukmani and, and, um, Sita had Ram. I mean, it was it was a male female combination, it and and that doesn't mean that it has to be in a couple. It doesn't have to be a man and a woman. It can be two men. It can be two women. It can be, you know, a threesome. I don't know, but you know, it it <laughs> but it has it has to have the energies, and if the energies are there, that's what's important. I think you're right. I mean, you know, in 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 um. In the Ram and Sita and with meaning Krishna, it, it was. I mean, there's there's some there's some touching moments in the Rukmini book. I think one of them was this great war is about to happen, and Arjuna the night before, and you know he doesn't want to face his. It's a family. His cousins and his teachers are on the other side, and he's got he's the great hero. He's got to go kill them, and he, he's he's um, struggling with this, and. You know, d- during the many years, whenever he would visit with Mina, she would send him in to do the most humble things. You know, send, uh-huh. send him to go drive, to be the charioteer, to drive one of the people in the women's quarters, or to to do different things, and teaching him humility, and teaching him to listen to their troubles, teaching him humility. So here's this great warrior, and now it's somebody, he needs somebody 
to listen to him with his agony the night before the war. Rukmini's not there in the battlefield. She's in, in Dwarka. She's in the, the palace. But she appears before him as he sits and listens to his troubles, uh, as he's spilling out his heart. And then she says to, she says to him, you know, um, it's, 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 the, the warriors who are going to die, it's already been decreed. They're going to die. You know, Krishna is both the warrior, the, 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 the one doing the killing, and the one who's killed. In other words, uh-huh. it's all part of the one divine. And he, she comforts him. And then she walks off after she comforts him because she sees that he's just playing his role. It's not him doing the killing. He's playing the role. And that's, of course, the great lesson of the Bhagavad Gita. And then she walks off, and he thinks that she's turned into Krishna. For a moment, she's uh-huh. into a so it's Rukmini turning into Krishna. And then he goes back to his tent, and there's Krishna waiting at the door for him, smiling. And he says, you know, she's come to you in your moment of agony. And, and to me, that's such a touching scene, how Krishna and Rukmini are working together, just like Ram and Sita were working together. You know, uh-huh. Krishna uh, enabled Rukmini to do what she did best, which was to be there for Arjuna in the moment of agony. Uh, and the next day they go into the battlefield. And and so it, so it, so it goes, you know. It's a brutal, brutal barrier, uh, battle. Um, so there are many, many touching things. And, and when I wrote the book, I was experiencing it. It was like I was back there, back there in time. You know, so um, yeah, there, there. Now that we're talking about it, I mean, I, every time I, I, I get very moved. <laughs> when I, we live Did, didn't, didn't his son die in that in that battle? Um, yes, his son. His son dies. A student son. That's a hard name. But Manu, his name is. And there's a yeah. whole story around that. Um, that's 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 rather complicated. Of, of when he when he agrees to take birth, he was given only 16 years to live on Earth, which is like 16 days in the divine realm. And uh-huh. so he's 16 when he goes to battle, and he makes a great sacrifice because Arjuna can't awaken the energy that he needs to kill his teachers, his grandfathers there, who who he was, he adores, and he can't. And Krishna keeps goading him on, and he just can't bring himself to do it. So he's not fighting his hardest. And then um, he gets lured to another part of the battlefield, and Abhimanyu um, goes into the battlefield knowing that he's going to die. He makes a sacrifice, and he gets has a brutal death. It's, the laws of, of war is one-on-one, warrior one-on-one, but they all attack him together. And when uh-huh. Arjuna realizes what they did to him, that's what awakens the fire in him, and the whole battle turns after that. So it was the sacrifice of his son that that awakened him. And so you feel sad about it, and then you realize, well, but he only had, he was only given 60 years when he took birth on, on earth. That was a known. And that's what he agreed to do. He agreed to come down to, to play this role. Uh, wow. So, so... There are many, many stories like that in the book. And again, it's seeing the back story, the hidden story. You know, often the way these these narratives are told, you don't get to see the back story. What really was yeah. that about? <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I, you know, you have um, children being taken away and, and not reunited until 20 years later. Um, you have um, the dancer's... Uh, brother being taken away, and and she yeah. reunites with him much later. Um, it's it's a wonderful dance that the book provides you with, and it does give you the little backstories. And and you you know you kind of always want to know, well, wait a minute, what happened to so and so? And and I'm sure <laughs> there's a backstory to it. You know, it, it, it's kind of like, yeah. we'll see. What do we and and in some of the earlier books, you know, the the servants and stuff, they keep coming back into play. And 
I love the way you wove some of the, the one of the previous books into this one too, with it becoming one of the stories the women sh- the women share. So um, you know you do there, there is definitely that's why I suggested earlier that they read the the books in order of um, publication, so that they would you're, you're they would absolutely catch- right. And I often at the beginning of a book I say some of the stories in here you know have their origin in my earlier books, but you don't really have to know that. So I've just finished another book, which we'll probably talk about later in the year, that Uh takes place in 12th century Tibet, and that weaves in some of these stories. It weaves in one of the stories from the Kamini book, Uh, because that's how karma works. I mean, you can't look at a life piecemeal. I mean, it would blow your mind, and I say this to every single person, it would blow your mind if you saw the whole picture. Just blow your mind. You know, in other words. Well, yeah, how, and, and, you know, knowing that you're male and female, knowing that, that um, you know, there there will be different kinds of relationships. Uh, you know, as a woman, it's hard for me to consider, you know, think about a, a lifetime as a man, and yet I'm sure there have been. But, you know, right now, I, can, I have trouble conceiving of that. So, and and not only that, but but if there were lifetimes where I was not kind, where I was not generous, where I was not loving, that would break my heart. I, I would want well, to beat me up. <laughs> well, I you know I I don't think it's that simple. Um, I think that there. I mean, you look at the in the Rukmini story, uh, Sujata, the main character, the dancer. Uh, uh-huh. You know, here she 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 uh, finally reunites with her brother, who's got this wonderful, wonderful wife, who treats her like a sister. I mean, you know, even though there's caste difference and all that, and she's quite cool to her actually. She's a woman who's got yeah. ill health until until she's shaken up, and and she's she's sort of like with me. She and then she wants to run back to with me, thinking with me he's going to take her in. She's, she's not going to live with her brother and sister-in-law because she doesn't like her sister-in-law. And Rukmini gives her a good shake-up. And she gets to see the oh, yeah. story. Why, why does she have this resistance to this wonderful woman? And then, of course, once she's woken from that, she wakes up from that, she, she becomes the closest to her sister-in-law and takes care of her in her last days. And so that's a transformation. She started out that dancer, not such a nice lady, <laughs> uh, but 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 through patient, loving care, with Mini helps her grow, and that's uh-huh. that's the story of the of the guru. I mean, that's the story of the divine ones. They 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 see our flaws, but it doesn't matter. All they're interested in is helping us outgrow them. There's no judgment, and that's that's one of the things that we have to shake off this idea of a judgment. There is no judgment; it simply does not exist. <laughs> we judge ourselves. Oh yeah, it's, and and I think karma there's is not two, about judgment. Two, it's no, not no. About <laughs> I think there are two it, places where also that there was there were lessons learned that that um, the dancer. Um, at one point gets severely burned and and she's unable to dance and she has to limp and dance yeah. has been her only way of expression and and you know ultimately um Rukmuni, uh asks her to dance and she keeps saying she can't she can't and then you know she she's basically told you know if she tells you you can dance you can dance and she dances and her limp is gone so it was a matter of faith and the other one was right. with the singer who was deformed and yeah. um and, and and you know she she was cast out from her family and she had a beautiful voice and and eventually through the singing she was healed that's right and so so that it's it's sort of like don't look at a deformity or a, or a problem as as something that holds you back Look upon it as something that challenges you to become better. Exactly, exactly. 
it's 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 awakening. It, it, it's again, it, it, you know, see, developing the a sense of gratitude and the positive attitude, and not uh-huh. falling into a sense of victimhood. No matter what what is happening to you, I mean, you know, Rukmini saves the dancer because she would have been killed. She say she sends uh-huh. somebody out and, and saves her, and then uh, the dancer, her her her, you know, I won't say what happened, but. She's so she's so uh, in much in despair. She's thinking to take her own life, uh-huh. and then uh, and then one of um, the main, um, I guess, assistants, you know, great a great woman yogi who's helping with Mimi, comes to her and says, "She didn't save you <laughs> to let you take your life." <laughs> yes, <Yeah. laughs> you know, and it was just just being in the presence, and that's what created the transformation in the dancer, just being in the presence of either Rukmini or this wonderful woman, um, Anjali, who is like the woman in charge, who is a, a very uh-huh. high being also, uh, just being in their presence and hearing their words helped her, you know, it was the presence that elevated her consciousness. And so I think that that's, you know, there are masters all around us, and if we can tune into them, we can have that same experience. I often say, you know, you don't need the physical uh, presence. You know, it's 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 tuning in to their to their energy, to their presence that can have the same effect. Oh, ab- absolutely, and I think that's. I I think too the dancer didn't want to be a dancer, and and so she didn't really get joy out of it until. Uh, <clears throat> Until she was much older and fell in love, and and then, then of course, yes. um, she was burned, and it, it she does later in life though dance again, and and it does bring her great joy, so that so that it's also yeah. a, a, it also has something to do with the fact that if you're doing something that gives you joy, magic can happen. And exactly. It is right. You know. <laughs> yes. Yeah. I mean, it isn't just dancing. I mean, it could be anything. But so long as you are occupied with something that gives you great joy and you don't even have to be good at it, that's that's the cool thing. Um, so long as that's it gives nice. you joy, that's, you know, good is in the eye of the beholder or the listener or whatever. But but um, I, I did find that, that there were there were characters here that, that – Got great joy from whatever they did, and in, in I think it was I, I it, the sick book. It was service that gave her, uh, someone great joy, and and that's where their their pleasure was, their joy was, and and it, it gave them intense pleasure, and that's where their awakening came through being able to take the joy of service. That's right. To other that's people. in the in <coughs> sick book. Yeah, the servant close to the eyes of the servant, and and that's how, that's what her life that was the purpose of her life, and and that gave her joy, and that I mean initially she resisted it, but she went through a transformation, and she she began to find joy in that, and I think that's that's the um, that's the trans the inner transformation of finding that inner contentment and joy wherever. A life situation has placed us, whether uh-huh. you know the challenges, it's difficult, whatever it is, because the joy is, is not really related to anything external. It's it's an internal uh, state, uh, and so it's that that's um, that's the growth that we see in many of these stories. The characters go through that, finding that that inner contentment and joy with where life has placed them. Well, and and for um, <clears throat> for the dancer, she was the reincarnation of someone who had been a servant to Rukmini in, I think, the Sitka lifetime. Sita. 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 She, she had been the servant to Sita. Rukmini, Rukmini was the rebirth of Sita, and this dancer had uh-huh. been a servant to Sita, and. Many of the many of the um, people that Sita had had contact with uh, at that time 
were naturally gravitated when she took birth again. They took birth around her. Uh, uh-huh. It was like a magnet, you know, a, a magnet drawing those souls. And I think that happens. You know, the guru also says when the guru takes birth, a lot of the ones he has known in the past, he or she has known in the past, just naturally uh-huh. are drawn to take birth at that time. And so many of the people from that ancient Kisita's ancient kingdom were reborn uh, around Rukmini as well. And and it's it, because the love bonds were formed. When the love bonds are formed, I mean, love is is, is the magnetism that that draws uh-huh. you. And so that love drew them to take birth. You know, uh, she's coming down. We're coming down too. <laughs> <laughs> Wait for me. <laughs> Yeah, I, I, but, but I, and I think that, that what we've got is, what was the last time frame of the last book that you wrote? How many thousands of years ago or whatever? Well, I've just finished another book. Uh, so so which book are you talking about? The, the one that we're talking the um With Mini? The Dawn. With, yeah. It's with Mini. So that... that it's probably three thousand years ago. It, it, it's it's the Kali Yuga. The Kali Yuga began around around a thousand BCE, uh-huh. and so um, give or take, it may have been eight hundred BCE. And so they say Krishna was at the was just before that. So he, it might have been around twelve hundred. And what BCE? about the so Tibet about, book? How how far back the does that book, go? The Tibet book takes place in 12th century Tibet. It, it again covers three lifetimes. One of the lifetimes, you'll be easy with the <laughs> with the names, one of the lifetimes takes place in medieval France in, in the uh, 11th century, and then Tibet, and then India. So it's three lifetimes. Again, it shows how karma from one lifetime weaves into the next, into the next. Things get completed, uh-huh. things that aren't completed weaves into the next. Uh, but, but primarily it's told through the, through the voice of a Tibetan woman who's remembering her past birth in medieval France. It's, it's, it, this, this book deals with a lot of, well, I don't want to talk too much about it, a lot okay. of issues because it's a time when women were being, in France, being burned at the stake. Uh-huh. Uh, uh, and, and it wasn't just the suppression of women, it was the suppression of the goddess. And the indigenous knowledge. Uh, I, I, yeah, I was just wondering if you're hitting the peaks or the bottoms of yugas or the transition between yugas with your books. Well, it, it, um, with the Sita book, yes. With the Rukmini book, yes. And even with the Bright Moon Rises, that begins in the Satya Yuga. Yeah. At a time when, when. Um, <laughs> It's a much more egalitarian society, much more harmony uh-huh. in society. The societies were small. Uh, uh, they were just kind of shifting into agriculture. Uh, uh, and so it was, it was, a, it was a lot of, of, of holding men and women, women sages. Uh, uh, they were, you know, aware of their connection with the universe, the stars, all that. Uh, so it was, it was different consciousness at that time, and then the Sita book is at, a, at the following yuga where there's already a lot of changes, and then the Krishna book, the Rukmini, uh, which is the beginning of the Kali Yuga. The Tibet book is sort of in the middle of the Kali Yuga, sort of coming into yeah. There's a lot of destruction taking place, a lot of conquest, uh-huh. um, a lot of changes, and I've just started a new book, which is oh. called Memories of a Future Life. And it takes place 200, 200 years in the future. Oh, wow. But well, I, that I sounds fascinating. It, it, you know, we can also know our future lives. Because if you can see your patterns, you can see what, what, what's, what's still the remnants of what's there. Uh, and what needs to be that, worked on, yeah. It needs to be worked on, yeah. yeah. That's very cool. I so, just, you so, know, I, mm-hmm. I, I am intrigued yeah. by 
you know, the the um, because these deities, of course, are not ones that I'm familiar with. I'm, I'm, I'm getting more familiar with them, but um, they they do represent um, archetypes. They do represent um, parts of all of us, and and I think that that in in putting them into stories like this and, and showing how their compassion touched humanity in many different ways and how um, I, I love the the parts where where they bilocate where you know they are here and then they're there or they can be in many places at once and and you know consciously we're all capable of that if we if we get to that point in consciousness so that. I think that in many ways you're you're showing parts of the human condition that can be raised to a higher consciousness level, and and you know the the, the element of being able to I mean I forget who it was uh, maybe in Yogananda or is it Buddha Buddha could could bilocate as well so that there there definitely are are talents and gifts that we hold within that perhaps out of fear of of be of touching into a power we don't have any understanding of we we avoid or we we don't go close to but you know your the, all of your books seem to be revealing the fact that 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 there there are compassionate energies out there that are helping to guide us and all we have to do is pay attention all of us will get there one day and the same qualities that they have are in us. They're trying uh-huh. to awaken it. And just as uh, time has no real relevance, and that you can be in the past and in the present or the future, you can be in many time periods at once, the same thing uh-huh. is true spatially. You know, you can be in different dimensions at once. And that's, they, 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 they are the living embodiment of that. Uh, uh, and we just don't know that we just we're that too, but we just don't know it yet. And so, uh, uh, step by step, you know, we 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 have to awaken to. That's why I say it's changed my whole sense of identity. As long as you're identified with this limited uh, personality and body, you don't know yourself to be that. But little by uh-huh. little, you realize, hey, you know. That's within the realm of possibility for me too. <laughs> you know. <laughs> well, karma plays such a an important role in all of this, and and you know that seems to be our our way of learning uh, by by assembling karma on one level or another, and and having it flow into a next lifetime, and being able to use it appropriately or not. Um, so, so that you know, in a way, karma seems to be the fuel that moves humanity forward. Exactly, that's exactly it. Karma is the fuel that helps us to awaken. I mean, if you hit yourself, you bump into a wall once. You might do it twice. You might do it a third time, but you're not likely to do it a fourth time if you know that every time you do that, it hurts. It hurts. Uh-huh. So eventually you learn what not to do <laughs> because you learn that it's going to hurt you. And I mean that's how a child learns, you know. Uh, um, you, you, you know, you 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 don't put your finger into the fire because you know it's going to hurt you. And so, but you maybe you have to put your finger in once to realize that when you're, you know, it's this is this is the way we learn. I mean, humanity has come to believe. We are slow learners because yeah. we keep repeating the same mistakes. And I've seen in my own life how I repeated mistakes, you know. You say, I'm not going to do that again, and then you go out and do it again. <laughs> you know? Well, so, sometimes you think maybe I can um, – um, <clears throat> I, I, a long time ago I was married to uh, a man who was an alcoholic. And it didn't end well. And after all was said and done and the dust had settled, mm-hmm. I often said to myself, you know, I'm older now. I'm wiser. I wonder if I 
knowing what I know now, could have handled the situation better, which was unwise to mutter because immediately another one came into my life (laughs) only to prove to me that, no, you can be as smart as you want. You can't fix it. So, (laughs) yeah. But, yeah. But, you know, I, and I saw that coming. I, you know, I, I really, I, I, I did think, you know, maybe I wasn't old enough or mature enough to, to deal with the issues that were at hand. And then once I got there, I realized that they weren't my issues, they were his. And, you know, yeah. that didn't end well either. But, <laughs> but, but you know, you always, well, it's you, unlikely, you, won't, you won't do it a third time. Oh, it's positive I will not do it a third time. <laughs> yeah, there is there is no question to that one. But but I, I think that we do often question ourselves and, and you know, sometimes, you know, you kind of want to see what if and and sometimes it's really not smart to ask to see the what if because the what if turns out to be we well, had dodged a bullet, so do you really have to go further? Um, so it, it's, uh, I, I am coming to realize that, that things do evolve the way they're supposed to. And, and, um, I guess we draw to ourselves those situations that will help us to learn more about ourselves, not necessarily other people. And exactly. I think that, and I think, I think we, we, the, go ahead. Go ahead. I was going to say, I think we each move at our own pace which is where we come back to about not judging people uh, uh-huh. because it's not, not fair to, you know, expect another person to, to, to be going at the pace you want them to go. <laughs> you know, everybody has their own, and you don't know the person's history uh, and what, what they need to work out. So I think coming to a, a place of, of just not, not judging any of it and, and and it is a temptation to judge, you know. Well, yeah, or or to to see a pattern and recognize that you've been through that and you know how it worked for you and how you got out of it and all of that. And and the reality is that that worked for you. It's not their pathway. And you know, sometimes you you really have to bite your tongue because you know you know where something's going and you know. Uh, you can't stop it. It's it's like watching a train wreck. You know, you, you just you can send love, you can be compassionate, but but if somebody needs to experience that, and don't get me wrong, if someone is standing in the way of a of a car or a train, I'm going to pull them back. You know, that may give me karmic debt for a lifetime or something. But um, you know, there there are times when when you really have to understand that when a lesson is learned, it's your lesson. Not theirs, right? And, you know, right. and and to be honest, there have been some lessons where, in retrospect, I was very grateful for the lesson, but not evolved enough to write a thank you note. Well, I think I think it's only when we look back that we can realize what a gift it was—a difficult uh-huh. situation. What a gift it was. Oh yeah. Um, I know, I you know, Ram Dass, when he had his stroke uh, and was so incapacitated, and and what did he what he wrote a book? What, was it Fierce Grace? Uh huh. About he was able to see what a gift he had been given. Now that's that's pretty something <laughs> to find to be able yeah. to see. Yeah. But but you know? and there is there is always a gifted stuff and I don't think people you know really grasp that 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 if you if you struggle and you and you make it through something you know you've learned something you've survived something and there should be joy in the fact that you made it through. Uh, who was it? Um, Barry Manilow has a song. I made it through the rain. And yeah. um, it, it's 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 basically the same philosophy. And everybody everybody addresses those kinds of issues differently. And and it's so hard to 
sometimes sit back and see someone going through a situation similar to something you've been through, and and you you can tell them what works for you, but it won't work for them. And and you know, oftentimes when I'm in that position, you know, I kind of review what I learned and find that there is even greater depths in it than I than I realize. So that you know, going back and and refreshing yourself on lessons that are learned understand that they're multidimensional and multi layers and it isn't you know there's always a little bit more of wisdom that you can gather from each experience and um it is exciting i i i love having the deities though taking human form on earth and intermingling with people i it it just it it makes them very human and yet they're not at all i mean and and the thing that 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 is that appears to be um consistent with all of them is the element of meditation that's the key that's the key is is because you're turning your you're turning your consciousness from the exterior world to the interior so uh-huh. you know you're not being totally seduced by what you're seeing and hearing and you know, what your body's feeling, and you're just able to go into the interior world, which is the gateway to the spiritual realms. I mean, you reach the spiritual realms not through not through a rocket ship uh, or looking up into the sky, but going inward. And, uh, uh-huh. you know, I think we would, we would today probably use the term dimensions, different dimensions. And I think when, when science really accepts two basic principles, one is that consciousness creates matter, not that matter creates consciousness. And that, in other words, the consciousness that created all of this and, and the fact that we live in a multidimensional universe where there are higher realms, you know, uh, uh, less pleasant realms. <laughs> There are many different <laughs> realms where, 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 and 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 we can uh, travel in them while we're here, and people do. Oh yeah, you know, in visions and dreams, you know, uh, we have con- we have we have a relationship with it. I mean, there's there's a, um, a being who appears in in many of my books named Satya. And he is again in the book that I've just finished, the Tibet book. But in the Rukmini book, I actually describe a human life that I had with him. Uh, and that was about about uh, 100 BCE, 50 BCE, around uh-huh. that time. And yet he's a being who doesn't reincarnate. He's, he's, he's finished that program. So... He, 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 but, but th- there's a, a deep internal bond with that being. And so I am, I'm in relationship with him, whether I'm here or there. Uh, I, 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 he's a being who's very much part of my world. And so it was very touching for me to write that story in the movie book of the life together on earth. Now, does he take this? He does not reincarnate, so he has the same form every lifetime, every he generation. He 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 doesn't mean he doesn't reincarnate on Earth anymore. He did, but there comes a time when we sort of graduate, and so then you live in another place. <laughs> You know, you graduated from the okay. real realm, and you're living in another place, and there's a parallel kind of life that you have there. You know, there's a whole life of things that you, but but you're working on a higher plane, so you might be assisting uh, earth beings, you might be uh-huh. um, assisting beings in that realm. I'm just beginning. I mean, I can't say that I know a, that I I have uh, that I'm I I can. Um, express a lot about that world i've had i've had glimpses of it and uh-huh. certainly we all have i mean where are we between lives we're someplace else oh yeah 
we are definitely someplace else. You know, I I had an experience a year ago. My father passed away. He had reached his hundred, so it was time for him to go. But I was very, very, uh-huh. very close with him. And after he passed, about you know, I began to talk to him about, okay, you know, now, now talk to me. Where are you? And about a few weeks after he passed, I heard him call my name, and I saw him, and I saw where he was, and uh-huh. I was able to go visit with him in the place where he was. And even now, there's a commu- communication that's ongoing. And so those realms are not imaginary realms. Those realms exist. They're just a different dimension. That, In other words, what does that mean, a different dimension? Our senses cannot pick up on, you know, we, we only, our eyes, our physical eyes can only see a very limited range. Our ears uh-huh. can only hear a limited range. And so there are things that could be right in front of us that we don't see. I mean, Yogananda used to say when he would give his talks, he would say, if only you could see the beings who come to listen. So, you know, they're, they're, that's what I mean about knowing that we live in a multidimensional universe and that we can access those planes through meditation, but through, through deep, deep, serious meditation, or through having a loved one, like I did with my father, uh, where I was able to see where he, where he is. And, and every now and then I do get, you know, uh, suddenly I'll see him with somebody that I know, and it's like, oh, well, they've like found each other. Uh, uh-huh. And it's the same thing that that um, I feel with, with, with Satya, that there's that ongoing communication. I don't know how to describe it, but it's, again, it's like knowing that it's by locating. It's knowing that we can be in many places at one time. So what's the ultimate purpose of the earth plane? It's a school. It's okay. It's it it's it's um you know I mean the purpose is to know that we're not limited to physical existence. That 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 we are a part of the whole, of the all, the cos- the cosmic consciousness that is dancing this dance. I mean, it's all for the sake of a of of of, of out of love creation happened. It's like an outpouring of love that manifested this world. And we're meant to play our roles and dance and be part of it and do what we do, but not to get lost in it. Not to think this is our home, this is our true nature. To 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 play out the things that we need to play out without getting totally caught in it. Yeah, that's that's an issue. That's something that, that a lot of people do get caught up in. And Everybody. Well, yeah. I, the older it's I get, the more, the more... <laughs> well, yeah, it's it, not true. Get but caught the, up in it. I mean, I have, I have cats. I'm a cat lady. And um, every now and then, my cats will suddenly be looking at someone who's not there. And I, and I know that someone is visiting. Um. And that the, their eyes will follow the, the, the energy um, around the, around the room. I mean, it's really quite yeah. it's, it's fascinating. And you know, if you if you quiet yourself and if you focus, you you can figure out who it is that's visiting, and you know, maybe even why. Uh, but I think knowing that there are those other realms, knowing that there are the levels of consciousness and beings of other consciousnesses that are out there that are on the earth plane at this moment too. I mean, healings do take place very quietly. Uh, Nobody in their right mind would draw attention to themselves by doing, you know, mass healings because then they get worship and would kill them. You know, I mean, we have have a very bad reputation for people that come to do that kind of good. (laughs) But, um, but it, it, seems fascinating to me that that um i i recently uh read uh read a book by an author who was talking about um a man who had who had died 
and 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 really died and um came back to life and you know while he could um it, it was it was fascinating he had total consciousness but he couldn't preach it he could answer questions but that he had to be asked a question in order to give information out and it felt like he was probably one of those that was here to share wisdom um mm-hmm. he's since passed on he i think he had two or three times that he passed and was brought back and and the last time he said he was he was not coming back so you know it's okay to rent his room type stuff <laughs> but <laughs> you know there there but but he was going to another realm and and it was kind of like it's okay it's it's my time i've served my term or whatever and and it's it's my time to go to another realm and there are other realms um anybody who meditates anybody who um does astral travel anybody who has had a near death experience they they all can speak to the fact that this is not it you know this is only a, a stepping stone right and i and i i think i think science will come to see that <laughs> I I don't think I, at this moment in time um, I've had a number of scientists try to explain to me how they can explain spirituality with science, science and it's kind of like okay you you wrote a book and we'll talk about it but I don't buy it <laughs> I mean I think there there will be a time where science yeah. and spirituality do do meet and flow together and mesh beautifully, I think we're yeah. uh, we're, we're a couple, if not a thousand, years away from that. But you know, I'll come back well, and check it out. Well, there there, there there's a, there's a um, you know there are a number of scientists. I say this because I'm organizing a conference and. February on spirituality and science and human awakening. So I've been looking into uh-huh. the scientists. There, there are, um, like the like the Institute for Noetic Science, there are scientists who have been working in this field, and a lot of the Buddhist monks have been working with uh, scientists on on the effects of meditation on the brain. And so uh-huh. I think I think there's a, there's a beginning of a convergence, but but um, they're a small group. <laughs> and I think very much will grow. <laughs> oh yeah, I I, th- I think there's a surgeon that, that actually died and came back to life, and and he's he's out there as, yeah. as an advocate, you know, for yeah. for you know, believe me, it happens, it happens type stuff. Um, and I think in our dreams, often we get glimpses of past lives. Um, oh, it, it's uh, yeah. it, it's kind of like. What is it they say? You are all the characters in your dream, and you know, in some cases that's wonderful, and in other cases it's a little scary. So, um, but but it is, you know, being of a human condition, I, it's, it's the meditation, and it doesn't have to be a particular kind of meditation. It just has to be meditation on a regular, on on a regular exactly uh, on on a, on a regular basis. With a serious yeah. intent, uh, you know, not not just for stress reduction or relaxation, but for spiritual purposes. Uh, uh-huh. um, I mean, and I think that the 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 fact that so much is available now that used to be kept for initiates, you know, a hundred uh-huh. years ago, it was not easy to to find meditation practices. You know, uh, uh, and even if, if if people are doing it more casually, it does produce some effect, some positive effect. Uh huh. I I think too. One of the things that you know just occurred to me that um, I find it fascinating that today there are more women, I would think, than men who participate in meditation on a regular basis and yet going back in time women i mean weren't even allowed to learn to read and write and 
you know, I don't think even meditation was a part of the 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 aspect of life that they were even open to that, you know, they could pray but not meditate. And and, you know, meditate was for the priests and the and the yogis and all of those guys and um so that even in, in some of your books it 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 kind kind of shows how how women were coming into their own in that they began with the meditation and went from there and and I know that in a couple cases here some of the characters um really didn't meditate and then they they decided that maybe they'd like to meditate so that it, it was it was funny that the meditation seemed to be the turning point where they became more and more aware spiritually yes well yes for the dancer um yeah she kept they kept with Mimi and Andrew, they kept pointing her in that direction but she wasn't yet at that stage um where where she really it wasn't until her incarnation really um with satya that uh-huh. she really was able to develop a meditation practice. It takes, you know, we take we take baby steps each lifetime. We take, we learn, we we awaken a little bit, we learn something, uh, and then a whole we face a whole other set of circumstances. But again, it's it's like the blink of an eye, you know. I mean, thousands of years seem like a long time, but it's a blink of an eye. Oh yeah. So it may, you know, it may seem like we're taking baby steps, but it's, <laughs> it's, um, it depends upon what vantage point you're looking at from. Well, yeah. If you're if you're sitting in the here and now, and you're listening to the show, and you know we're talking about how how awakening and enlightening meditation can be, and you have never tried it. Um, you know, there are a lot of people that will kind of go, poof. But the reality is, uh, it, it does you know, it, what, 15 minutes? You start with 15 minutes or or do an, do an empty mind meditation where your mind is empty for five minutes and then stretch it till you get to about 10 or 15 where you can sit with an open mind and just listen. Um, Absolutely. Yeah. I think that... that- you know, if if any of these things that we've been talking about appeal to you, um, then 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 it's it's time to start. You know, if you want to um, feel, you know, begin to taste that unconditional love, or to begin to taste an expanded concept of yourself, or the possibilities of life, and <clears throat> and and have and have knowledge of other dimensions, you have to start somewhere. And you're right. Yeah. You start with five, ten minutes. I mean, with with my grandchildren, I tell them five minutes. You know, five yeah, minutes is, is better than no minutes. <laughs> yeah, it's a start. I mean, it's yeah. it's to to just empty your empty your thoughts and and you know, just let them pass through, not not dwell on them. Um, <clears throat> it's it's not easy. And and yet, once you get to the point where you can do that, there's a sense of peace and tranquility that comes over you, and you know it becomes a part of your life. Then, and you know it it, it does help you to focus. It does help you to move th- through situations that that you know are are potentially difficult. But the the more at peace you can come within, the more at peace you can be without, and it right. it. It takes it takes very little to you know you know it's one of those it's a gift that you give to yourself and it's a gift that keeps on giving and um, it's yeah, I'm not saying everybody has to do it but I know I know many people who are looking to evolve spiritually that are trying to get it out of a weekend class that they get a certificate from and that just doesn't work um, yeah. <clears throat> it's, yeah, I mean the work. The work is really in your daily life. Uh huh. You know, I mean, meditation helps you see your your life in a different way. So you you begin to it, it, it you begin to 
have some clarity about, uh, you know, really what what your work is in this life. What what are you called here to do? And how can you best do what you need to do without incurring, you know, more difficulties in the future? I I think you hit on the one thing that that most people that I that I talk to at great length anyhow are are concerned about it is is you know what is my purpose this lifetime you know what is the pathway I should be on what should I be doing with my life and that's you know that's a hard question to answer who do what do you say to people who are genuinely wanting to know what their pathway is and not knowing how to find it. I think starting a meditation practice, um, I mean, you can't tell somebody else what their pathway is. That, no. Uh, that's something that, that's an internal process, uh, and it's such an individual thing. But I know that whenever anybody came to my guru with a problem, he would not tell them the answer. He wouldn't say you do X, Y, and Z. He would say go meditate. In other uh-huh. words, go inside and find the answer. You have an inner guide. The answers are inside. Your your higher self knows what to do. <laughs> it's a matter of tuning into that higher self. It's a matter of learning to listen. And over time, one can hear more discreetly you do uh-huh. have that inner guidance, almost like the inner guru. You know, uh, I mean, I, I, when I was, I found my guru Yogananda when I was very young. He'd already left the body, and a lot of my friends were running off to India to find their guru and saying, "Oh, you need a guru in the body. Why don't you come to India?" And I said, "But I'm already taken, you know." <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like I can, I'm taken. Um, but it yeah. was painful that I that I couldn't go ask him questions or write to him, or I had to learn to find him inside. And I'm so grateful for that that I never depended on an external figure; that his presence was within me, and that I that I could find the answers inside. And uh-huh. even the 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 uh, students who lived with him and were around him, that would be his teaching to them. He wouldn't say, "Oh yes, well yeah, time to leave your husband. You're right." Or that's the job for you. <laughs> Go inside and find the answers. <laughs> and I think that's yeah. what a true teacher does. Learns you, teaches you to to find uh, your inner guide that will that will guide you. So, I mean, I know you know there's a stage in life when you're young where you are looking for your direction. Uh, you don't know what your calling is. It, it takes it takes a while. I mean, I I can't say that I really came to know my calling until I was in my forties. Um, you know, you're raising your family, you're raising you're raising children, you're sort of swept along by one thing or another. Uh, and so uh-huh. it's different for everybody. Um, but I think that you have to trust in life and you have to learn to listen to your inner guide. And the way to find that inner guide is by turning inside. Uh-huh. There, was, there was one teacher who... Um I I did I never I never met him but I kind of wish I had the people that that were with him um he said I'll answer any question and you know they would ask him stuff and he just wouldn't say anything and finally finally one of the students said you know if if you you, you said you'd answer any question and he said yes but you have to ask the right question to get the answer and so then they they said about trying to to find the right question to ask and they found that when they found the right way to ask the question they already had the answer <laughs> yeah <laughs> yeah yeah the answer but you know everybody are... you know every everybody wants somebody to tell them you know yeah you, you know you're on the right path but do this or Whatever I yeah. usually just oh, yeah. tell people. Yeah. I I ask people, "Are you joyful?" And if they say yes, I say, "Then you're on the right path." Well, that's true. You, 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 that's absolutely true. I mean, it doesn't really matter, you know, what your calling is, as long no. as you're finding fulfillment and joy in it. It uh-huh. doesn't really matter. There's 
there's a story of um, it's in Yogananda's book. Uh, I think it was a story with his teacher's teacher, a great yogi of the 19th century called the Hari Mahasaya, and he had he was sitting with his with his uh, students, and one student said to him, um, "When can I get the higher my, the higher meditation practices?" Oh, he says, you want the higher meditation practice? Says, yeah, yeah, when can I get them? And he, the teacher is quiet, and then he calls one of the students in the back, who's a, a postman. And he he says, would you also like the higher meditation practices? Oh, no, 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 Master. I'm in so much joy from what you've given me, I can't handle anymore. Please, please, no more. He was overwhelmed with joy just with the small practices that he had. <laughs> so, um, so the the the, the lesson is that um, finding the joy is the key. <laughs> it's not absolutely. You got you know the first stage, the second stage, or the third stage. You could be at the highest stage and still not feeling that joy if you if you're getting the advanced practices. Uh, uh, but if you're not feeling the joy, what's the point, right? Oh yeah, and I, I for for years, for well almost 20 years, I, I had a meditation group, and at at during one of them, someone had a newborn that they had to bring because there was no no place to to leave the baby, and every now and then it 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 it, it, it did what new babies do, and they it, it cried a little, but then it settled down. And somebody said to me, you know, it would have been a great meditation if the baby hadn't interrupted me. And I said, if you really were meditating, you wouldn't have heard the baby. <laughs> you know, um, sometimes, right, sometimes my guru would take his students to the amusement park and have them uh-huh. sit under the roller coaster and meditate. Because yeah. if you hear the if you hear the roller coaster, you're not meditating. <laughs> Or exactly. You hear it, but if you're disturbed by it, you know, I mean, you can be in a noisy place as long as it's not disturbing you. What difference does it make? I mean, I did. I I didn't necessarily advocate that they bring the baby every time, but it it, it did provide an, an amazing lesson. Yeah. Because you know, if if they were truly meditating, they would not have been bothered by the baby. I didn't hear the baby. Um, but but apparently this this one snoot did so. Um, it's again you know, it, it, your inner state. What what ruffles you? If you're being ruffled yeah. by something, well, it's time to take a look. Why is that ruffling you? You know. Um, yeah. So we have to do. Well, I mean, I always say meditation coupled with introspection. Oh yeah. You have to. You have to be sort of observing yourself and, and seeing what's throwing you off, uh, what's getting you agitated, what's getting you out of that centered, that centered um, state. Yeah, and and I, I will admit that there are times in my life where, you know, things just don't seem to be going the way I intended, and and then it's like, you know, okay, so why am I upset and? Maybe this wasn't appropriate for me, and and I'm resisting it on some level, and that's causing the issue that's going on. And I think when we when we look not only into ourselves for the peace and the harmony, the love and the compassion, we also look to ourselves. I believe to if I'm going through a difficulty, how am I a part of it? How did I cause it? Why did I draw it to myself? And what is the lesson here to learn? That's that's the key. Is is because the sooner we learn our lessons, the sooner we move on. So you know, if yeah, we don't learn it, a lesson, then some, it will come to us in another way. Yeah, you know, like you know, so the, it's like the first alcoholic husband. Didn't didn't do it. The second alcoholic <laughs> man had come. <laughs> yeah. I was rather presumptive of me to think I could, you know, cure it and everything would be fine and lovely. <laughs> um, yeah, that was that was quite a. Cho- you know, I looked at that and I thought, what was I thinking? And um, you know, and 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 the element 
of laughter, I think. I mean, it, it, it hasn't. It, it we haven't really talked about that, but to me, joy and laughter is such a crucial part of spirituality and joy. And well, if the universe you know, has such humor, also, I mean, uh, uh, okay. if you really observe things, <laughs> you see that there's humor built into the system. Yeah, and it's true. And you know, so many people think you know you're being irreverent if if something you know is is just outright funny, and and yeah. it's 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 not. I mean, there 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 is joy in the universe. I mean, there's joy in love. There's joy in everything that's out there. And to be able to laugh at the the ridiculous things that we put ourselves through um, is is just. Um, I don't know. It is it is such a relief. It's such a stra- it's a stress reliever to be able to just sit down and really laugh about half the stuff we put ourselves through. I think that is the medicine. And when I when I look at how much angst there is in the world, uh-huh. how, how much anger? I mean, and you can't even say what's the anger over. It just seems to be anger, you know. I mean, anger and fear and it's like you know, why are you getting yourself so worked up? <laughs> really? Yeah. It's, it's, people have forgotten. People have forgotten joy. They've they've forgotten how to laugh. They've gotten so caught up in the drama. <clears throat> you know, and if you're caught up in the drama, it's not a happy drama. <laughs> no, and and I think in a couple places of your book, you have. All of them. There are places where people just explode with laughter, and yeah. and I think I sure. think that's yeah. important for for people to understand that that sometimes laughter is truly the best medicine. And and while meditation is quiet and serious, laughter is is enlightening and and can lift you out of so many different situations that, that you can't crawl out of, but you can laugh your way out of. Um, so there's, there's, a, it, there's it, a, a touching part in the book where it's the middle of the war and the dancer has gone to, to, the, to the field, to the field where all the wounded lay and Rukmini is healing them. And her uh-huh. brother is missing and she's going into the forest to find her wounded brother. She gets lost. She falls to her knees and for the first time calls out to Rukmini because it's nighttime. She's in the forest alone and she doesn't know if she's going to survive. And then uh-huh. this beautiful man comes and, and, and spends the night hurt with her. And what does she do? She starts to dance. Uh-huh. And then she starts to laugh, and she says, "Is this crazy? We're in the middle of this brutal war, and here I am dancing." Of course, he's taken out his flute and playing the the instrument while she's while she's dancing, and he says, uh-huh. "No, it's the right thing to do because yeah. we have to, ha- even in the worst of circumstances." I mean, I was reading an article about uh, made me think of that. I was reading an article today about Ukraine and the bombs, you know, the sirens uh, go off in Kiev, the bombs fall, and this man has opened his dance studio. And when the sirens go, he tells everybody to go get shelter. The sirens stop, and they come back. And he says, you know, are you sure you want to be here? There could be another bomb. And they say, no, we want to dance. This uh-huh. is happening right now in Ukraine. In Kiev, with the missiles hitting them, there's, there there are people who are dancing. That's a beautiful story. Absolutely, and and you know even in the concentration camps, there was joy and there was laughter, and 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 there was the opposite end of the spectrum as well. But but most of the people that survived were able to to find that kind of a sense of wholeness and and love and peace and everything within themselves. Um, I know that that it it it's a terrible thing to say, but it's it's if you can laugh, you can heal and you can survive. 
Is that for and, the and it's, I mean, it's, it's medicine. I'm yeah. sure that there there are scientific, you know, brain wave reasons why you can say it releases things that really heal, releases chemicals um, that that uh, that 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 are beneficial to the body and mind. Oh, it, it, yeah, it releases endorphins, and and there there is something about it. It's 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 like music, music that is created by someone who is truly an artist rather than a technician will touch your spirit and your soul will fly. It will carry you away. It will it will enable you to fly and, and um it's it's magical and with any sort of creative process there are the technicians that are absolutely perfect but cold and then there are the artists that have opened their spirit to flow through them and create whatever it is they're creating, and you can see the creation there. You can feel the energy of it, and and often it, it's with music or or paint or whatever, and it's it's just magical. And I think it's important that people understand that that laughter has to be a part of all of this. If it's not, you're missing an element. And and that doesn't mean that you play you know that you play terrible jokes on people. But it's sharing laughter about the simplest, most foolish things ever. And and when you get laughter going, um, I, I worked uh, in the pulpit for a number of years, and I found that um, if I could, with whatever I was sharing with the with the a congregation, if I could get them to laugh, I mean really laugh, I knew that they would get the message that I had been speaking about. Um, the very first time I did it, I put everyone to sleep, and I think I took a nap too. Um, it was I even forgot to take the collection. I mean, you know it was really disaster, but after that, I realized that you know sharing my own personal experiences and saying, "Okay, this is the mistake I made. Um, don't you make this one you know create one of your own but but you know somewhere within all of it, the stupidity that I had created for myself was really, you know, and and they laughed with me at my at my silliness and they remembered the lesson. And mm. and that works for spirituality too. If you can put a message into something that is joyful, people will remember it. That's absolutely they true. they will you know, they 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 won't remember something that bored them half to death, but they will remember something that made them laugh. That's so, true. Yeah. Yeah. And 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 they'll, they'll come back for more. I mean, people want to be. I mean, everybody's looking for joy. Oh yeah, and and it's true. We look for it in wrong places. <laughs> well, and you know something, joy can be just so. Um, we have um, a culvert behind my condominium that fills with water, and it fills pretty deeply. And one of my neighbor's children, who has a a psychological problem and doesn't talk a lot she got in that water and she was flopping around she was diving in she was floating she was you know and we didn't think about the fact that there were probably dead bugs and snakes and all sorts of she she was so joyful anybody seeing her started laughing too for the joy that she was experiencing it was one of the most blissful things i have ever seen oh and and isn't that nice Oh, she was. She was just. I, I have. She's a very quiet kid, but she was screaming with laughter and and floating and picking dead leaves out of the water. And it did get very deep. And um, but she just. And it was still pouring rain. So it was like you know. It, it was just the most magical thing I've seen in a long time. I have never seen such joy exemplified. It was just magical. And, and after that, we realized that there had been snakes in there and everything, and we told her not to do it again. But it was <laughs> it was really fun the first time. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Well, you know, um, you see with children, they get joy from simple things. Yeah. You know, um, and 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 then I think as you get older, you sort of come back to that state of just. Wanting to keep it simple and just finding joy <laughs> in, in simple things, you know. Yeah, 
This is true. This is true. Well, I I have taken great joy out of all four of your books. I will I will talk to you in a day or so to find out when we can do the Tibet book. Um, okay. There's always it, such yeah. a that's going to be that's going to be uh, well, it's a continuation of the series. That's all I can say. And it, it should be out by the spring. It, it should be ready, you know, available by the spring. I will so. pin you down in a day or so. And okay. um, and 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 I we're we're almost out of time. And I I want to thank you so much again for. Um, you know, bringing all of your wisdom and and, and magic here and I'm grateful you're going to use easier names to pronounce next time um, <laughs> yeah. you did pretty well though <laughs> well yeah but but um, let's see her her brother's name was what Abhishek Abhishek I, ca- I, I came close I came close yeah yeah you um, good no I <laughs> no it was it was like oh Oh, she can't do this to me again. <laughs> so, uh, you're not the only but, one. but you're not. Many of my friends have said the same thing. I mean, of course, um, these books are popular in India, um, especially uh, the Sita book and the Rukmini book. And so, for them, it's just like Tom and Tom and Jim, you know. Yeah. Well, well, I you know I look forward to the next one, and and. Um, and again, you, you, you people out there should read the whole series. It is enlightening. It's fascinating. And you actually learn a lot about a culture that you, you hadn't really dipped into ever before, probably. I know I haven't, and yet I'm now thrilled with it. So um, it, it, it is a wonderful expansion of understanding of reincarnation and the purpose of life. And um, I highly recommend it. And And I'm so thankful for you to... You know, to have done it and to have spent time with me and and go through all of this material. Um, I can't wait for the next book. It was a pleasure, and I look forward to the uh, next conversation. So (laughs) you take good care, and everyone who's been listening, be well and take good care. Thank you. Much, Lee. Good night now. Good night. Bye. Okay, everybody. Thank you so much for listening. Um, This has been... A remarkable show. I hope you got out of it as much as I did. Um, she's an amazing author, and she teaches with um, such a, a joie de vie that you can't put the books down. So it's it's an exciting it's an exciting adventure to read through her four books, and I would I would do them in order because uh, you'll learn a great deal. Good night now.